when Kayla, my daughter, was about 11, she was almost as tall as me. In fact, she had almost reached her full adult height. She was always tall. She and Jess Garber were pretty much always the tallest kids in their class. Taller in third grade than a lot of kids were in sixth grade. And one day she showed up to church with the most amazing, beautiful, rather short dress on. It was all beadwork and lace, and I looked at her and I said, good heavens, that's beautiful. Where'd you get that? And she said, it's my flower girl dress. Kayla had been a flower girl when she was four. Four! But now at 11, it still fit. Mostly. A lot of us growing up physically, you know, we just stretch and stretch and stretch, and we never grow out for a while. That happened to me. The transition from sixth to seventh grade was a big deal in my school district. You see, we didn't have a junior high. We didn't have a middle school. Our high school held all of us, seventh grade to twelfth grade. And if that was not bad enough, to be subtly sharing the hallways with full adult-sized human beings that kind of like to bounce you around, my grade school was tiny. There were only like 20 of us. And most of the kids came from the big school, Central. A school where there were multiple classes for each age group. So these kids came and they had all these friends and us, not so much. Well, anyway, between sixth and seventh grade, I had a growth spurt. I probably shot up eh, three inches that summer. And that's not an enormous growth spurt, but three inches does make a difference. So when it was time to go back to school, my mom said, hey, go get your spring clothes, you know, my long pants. Let's see if they fit or if we have to uh, go out and go some, do some shopping. Well, sure enough, they fit. They fit fine around the waist, around the back, around the legs. They fit great. They were, however, significantly shorter than they had been in the spring. My mom looked at them and said, ah, it's great. She was probably thinking, why well, have socks if you can't see them? And yes, you could see my socks fine. Really fine. Really, really fine. And on my first day at my new school, I was christened flood pants. You know, flood pants? Pants you can wear in the flood because they'll be safe from the high water. Hey, flood pants, come on over here. You need a pencil? Ask old flood pants. Flood pants! Don't you know there's a Salvation Army here in town? And later, when I got pants that were a little longer, flood pants, where the heck are your flood pants? <laughs> you know, it was kind of funny. But mostly for them. For a kid who was already feeling insecure, separated from most of the people he'd been going to school with since the first grade, Dealing with lockers and changing classes in the basement, essentially, of this mammoth old building. It hurt. It hurt a lot. The truth is, it broke me inside a little. So God calls to Moses, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. But of course, there's part of the story we didn't hear today, right? Moses doesn't want to do it because he can't speak well. Now, this has been displayed in films and skits about Moses over the years as everything from a full-out stutter to just this hesitancy to come on and just say something. 
But one thing's for sure. Moses did not feel up to the task. And probably all of his life, Moses had been told, you are not up to the task. Remember, he grew up in Pharaoh's house. Imagine being this kind of different, maybe kind of funny-looking kid in that house who, on top of it, couldn't speak correctly, surrounded by all those children of intellect and privilege. Imagine what they must have called him. And probably each name coincided with the word stupid. No wonder Moses would finally say, God, please send someone else. Every one of us is broken in some way. Life breaks us. Maybe it's because of a difficulty we have, like Moses, who couldn't speak correctly. Maybe it's because someone does the job for us. It happens in all kinds of ways, but it happens. No matter how we try to insulate ourselves, our kids, our friends, our loved ones, we all get broken. And do our share of breaking as well. But believe it or not, being broken can become a gift. It can become foundational to who we are. Being flood pants for a year of my life, long after Christmas had passed, and I actually had pants that fit, it taught me a lot. It made me some of who I am. In some ways, it made me tough, even though it hurt, which was good because, of course, more hurt was going to come in life. It taught me to lean on God and to trust. It also taught me to be funny, <laughs> to utilize the family defense mechanism of humor, because eventually I got tired of being ridiculed and just sitting there and feeling like I was going to cry, and so I began to vocally retaliate. Hey, flood pants, yes, bed hair. What? It's called a comb. It has these things. They're called teeth. It comes with instructions. I'm sorry. It probably taught me to be a little mean, too. It turned me more deeply to music because I needed somewhere to soothe my soul. But maybe the most important thing it taught me was just pain. The pain of not feeling good enough. The pain of not feeling accepted. The pain of believing I was inadequate, at the very core, inadequate. Because that made me human. It made me human. And it helped me understand what others were feeling. And later in life, it made me sometimes able to help them. You might say it helped me to wade when the floods came. Moses, of course, would become great. From a man who was afraid to open his mouth to the greatest man his nation would know until the time of Christ. A leader of strength and wisdom. A leader who would rail against a king and with God's help achieve something that anyone looking from the outside would have said was completely impossible. And who knows? Perhaps because he spent his broken earlier life keeping his mouth shut, he found out he had something to say. I say this a lot. What breaks you, makes you. What breaks us teaches us how to survive, how to overcome, how to get better. It also teaches us how to live in love.
with compassion. Desmond Tutu puts it this way. Nothing beautiful comes without some suffering. There's an old story about a place where beautiful vases are made. And in this place, the potter will take some clay and put it on a wheel and carefully craft the vase and then meticulously glaze the vase and then put the vase in the kiln and bake it. And then once the vase cools, drop it on the ground. And then, using another glaze, the potter will put the pot back together, piece by piece by piece, and the masterpiece is born. God does not seek to break us, nor does God desire us to feel pain and loss, but God also knows like every parent comes to realize. It's the only way we learn. And just as God worked through Moses, God wants to work through us so that we might take our broken insides and make that into something beautiful, something that is a gift to the world. Desmond Tutu says one more thing. You are a masterpiece in the making. Understand, God is not done with any of us yet. Trust the master potter. Beauty will come if we let the master do the master's work with us. And with that help, wholeness and peace will come when we share our broken selves with the world.